Hello and welcome to Moderate Fantasy Violence, a podcast about pop culture and the world around it. I'm Alistair. And I'm Nick. And in today's episode, we'll be searching the mortal and metaphysical world for our symbols of power in Sandman, and then hiding out under a false identity in Omaha, Nebraska, for the final episodes of Better Call Saul. But before all of that, Nick... What have you been up to recently? Well, there's a lot of very buzzy TV there, but I'm going to throw another one in now because I, as ever, have seen the first couple of episodes of the latest Disney Plus Marvel event, She-Hulk. This is, of course, the new series about Bruce Banner's cousin who gets very similar powers to him in a horrible accident and instead of becoming a miserable, friendless, angry outcast, decides to try and continue her day-to-day life as a lawyer. And yes, we're in a sort of very, very comedy end of the... Marvel Cinematic Universe here, a bit of gentle bobbing fun, starring Tatiana Maslany of Orphan Black fame as Jennifer Walters slash She-Hulk, although of course for the She-Hulk part, rather than relying on Maslany's chameleonic acting skills for Orphan Black, we are using a lot of CGI. And yeah, I've quite enjoyed this so far, I think to be honest we're so early on it's going to be hard to tell whether it succeeds or not, it's definitely succeeding in being entertaining. I think it's quite scrappy this show, in a sort of slightly make it up as they go along, we're going to do this because it seems fun way which works with their general aesthetic and is held together quite well, again, just by how good Tatiana Maslany is. Whether it's going to be an amazingly told tight story, I'm not sure, but I'll be honest, I'm willing to be happy with Marvel stuff as long as it's fun and not boring. And the two episodes so far have been pretty fun. The first one was basically an extended origin story, and the second one, they moved her a bit more into the setup for the rest of the series of her trying to go about her day-to-day lawyer life and the effect this has on her job. And yeah, both of them were very fun in different ways. Part of me feels like they should have dropped them both at the same time, because I feel like, especially retrospectively, the first episode kind of felt like half of a pilot, but they were both pretty entertaining, so I'll take what I can get. Yeah, I've also seen uh, the beginning of this show, and yeah, I agree with what you have to say. It's definitely got the humour. I get the feeling they're not taking this one particularly seriously. You know, which obviously, you know, Marvel does that blend of like an action and humour very well. As we've discussed, the Hulk has, especially in some of the film versions, I think particularly the Ang Lee film that's not in the MCU, leans more towards the tragedy of the Hulk as a sort of, you know, his nature drives him away from everyone and and everything whereas this you know they're kind of leaning more on isn't it funny to sort of have a superhero life and like a normal life yeah the humor is working and they kind of just did the whole yeah exposition bit like quite early on and kind of can through that and like right now you get the deal here's the story yeah, and I think the Hulk, even though he's been around for obviously, I guess, arguably the second longest of all the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe properties, because he was the second film they made back in the glory days of the late 2000s. Yeah. And yet, for whatever reason, I, I think there might be some studio legal shit involved, I don't really know. They've never, never really given the Hulk a movie and got into it in depth, he's always been a guy who just turns up for Avengers movies and occasional cameos elsewhere. So, an actual Hulk project, to actually dive into it a bit, despite how long Hulk has been around in these films slash shows is actually new territory it is actually something that hasn't already been done and giving the sort of contrasting vibe of jennifer walter's she hulk who the main difference between her and bruce is that she isn't consumed by unstoppable rage when she becomes she hulk she can more or less control the transformations at will and when it happens she's just the same person only bigger and greener so obviously there's some pretty heavy contrast there with the hulk especially the sort of early days hulk it'll be interesting to see how much the show explores that i think between that and the lawyer stuff there's a lot to get into and and they seem to mostly be determined to keep it pretty light. I'm good with it. I think they, they promised it would be a sitcom. And I will say, if it's going to be a sitcom, they need to start having like episodic storylines. The one thing that these shows are apparently allergic to. And yeah, having seen two episodes, there's no sign of an episodic storyline evolving yet. But the stuff they're doing is pretty fun. So I'm not really complaining. Yeah, the other crucial difference is these episodes are shorter. They're like 35 minutes rather than, you know, sort of usual hour length things, which is closer to sitcom running time. Well, yeah, especially when you consider just how much credits are banned onto this. Yeah. And, <laughs> and the incredibly long opening crawls and so on. Like, there's probably only about 25 minutes of actual episode in these 35 minute chunks. So, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely the closest to a sitcom vibe they've ever attempted, and they're they're getting it. They're getting there. They've definitely made something that's very much going hard towards the comedy end of their own spectrum. It's probably the most straightforward comedy alliance thing they've done, and it's it's a lot of fun. It's self consciously quirky in a way that some people may find infuriating. You know, I've tried to recommend like Crazy Ex Girlfriend to people before, a show that had a not dissimilar vibe to this, I suppose. And some people liked it, other people found it unbearably self aware and quirky. And I suspect those same people might find She Hulk a bit of a struggle. But as someone who likes Crazy Ex-Girlfriend and likes those kind of shows, I'm here for it. Is this particularly close to a, a particular She-Hulk comic they're adapting or in tone? Is this a new tone for She-Hulk? The specific story, I think, is kind of something they're 
making up, but the general vibe, the idea of her practicing law as Jennifer Walters slash She Hulk, especially as they reveal in the second episode, superhuman focused law. She's working in the superhuman law division, is something from a run of comics by uh, the writer Dan Slott in the early 2000s, which was very, very well received. It's probably in the top two most influential She-Hulk runs, and there have been more She-Hulk comics since then, a lot of which have very much picked up where Dan Slott left off. So yeah, they're very much doing one of the most popular, successful versions of She-Hulk. Oh, cool. Well, yeah, I guess it's early it's early days with this one, but, you know, I like the humour, so let's see where it goes. Yeah, they've also got the, the gimmick of She-Hulk talking to the camera in Fleabag style, which is fun, I guess. So far, I haven't really done anything desperately clever or original with it, but I, li- I like the jokes, so whatever. That level of self-awareness is sort of quite sitcom-y. Yeah, again, it's a level of self-aware quirkiness, which, as I just said at length, you will either love or hate. It is a bit Wonder Years. <laughs> yeah. I guess that, I guess that's all, all sitcoms that do kind of self-aware voiceovers, pieces of the camera, and all of that are kind of, you know, everything from, as you say, Fleabag to Peep Show. It, it is all in some way referencing back to the Wonder Years. Yeah, I mean, it's referencing... Comic-wise, She-Hulk in the comics, especially in actually a different run by um, the writer-artist John Byrne, who she used to have a lot of pieces directly talking to the reader or complaining at the writer. She was a character who was aware she was in a comic in a, a slightly less obnoxious, but still kind of deadpool way. She was doing it long before him, to be fair. I, I don't know how far they'll go there. I don't know to what point she'll start, I don't know, snarkily mentioning Kevin Feige or whatever. We'll see how far that goes. Yeah, it was inter- yeah, it's interesting that there is a precedent for this this level of sort of self-aware humour. Oh yeah, it's all fairly directly homage from the comics. It's not as, like, intimately adapting the comics beat for beat as another show we'll be discussing shortly, but it's definitely very heavily influenced by them, yeah. Anyway, that's what I've been watching. Alastair, what about you? Well, from a comedy to a tragedy, I have went to see a new film from Ari Folman, uh, who's an Israeli director. Long-term fans of the show will remember Remember that we covered his debut feature, Waltz of Bashir, one of my favourite films, if not my favourite film, which was one of the very early recommendations. Yeah, yeah. I've been to see his new film, which is called Where Is Anne Frank? The story of this is Anne Frank wrote her diary to a fictional imaginary friend that she created called Kitty. The movie begins with Kitty comes to life from the diary in present day Amsterdam. So yeah, in the guise of a, a young teenage girl and kind of goes out into the world to discover what happens to Anne Frank. And yeah, part of it is like Kitty reading the diary in which you get filled in the story of Anne Frank and her diary through the war but with Anne talking directly to Kitty her imaginary friend who kind of I know sits on her bed or sort of shares a room with her and then the other half of the story is Kitty in the present day in contemporary Amsterdam and she meets a group of refugees who are about to be deported obvious parallels are drawn shall we say so yeah I mean it's obviously got a clear political message about the Anne Frank of today but I guess on some level this is a a children's film I can't find the certificate but this is nowhere near as dark as a film like Waltz of Bashir but it is a real tearjerker yeah and it really doesn't pull its punches when it comes to the the ending of the story and the sad tragedy of Anne Frank's short life well yeah I was going to say the involvement of Van Frank doesn't often suggest it's time for a fun, light-hearted She-Hulk style trip to the movies. No, yeah. it is very good. I would strongly recommend this. Yeah, it's got a real, so yeah, modern political message. Ari Folman is a great animation director and is beautifully animated. Amazing soundtrack. Yeah, he's again same with Walter Bashir. He's got a real good ear for film music. It's very sad. You'll cry when you get to the end. Yeah, it's not an uplifting recommendation. Yeah, it's got a very contemporary political political message to it, which, um, yeah, is an interesting take. And also, yeah, weaves in the, the legacy of Anne Frank now that, you know, Amsterdam has the Anne Frank School and the Anne Frank Bridge and the Anne Frank Theatre, and they're all sort of weaved into the story. Okay, so we're in very meta territory here. Yeah, yeah, because the diary and the book based on the diary is, like, yeah, a plot point of the film. And, yeah, there's, like, there's a key bit when Kitty, like, gets a copy from the library of, of the diary, and obviously, I think she's talking to the librarian, and the librarian mentions the ending, and obviously... Well, I won't spoil it, but that's a very sad bit. <laughs> well, oh, we're not spoiling the ending of the diary of Anne Frank, okay. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, we'll assume everyone knows how that ends, but one of the key revelations that the film sets up, which is Kitty begins as a quite light-hearted sort of, you know, free spirit and then becomes aware of what happened to her friend. Because yeah, at the beginning, she's not aware of what happens to Anne Frank. She's not even aware what time she is. She's just searching for her, her missing friend, I guess. That's why the title is Where is Anne Frank? Okay, so it's kind of the opposite film to Jojo Rabbit then. Yeah, I mean, they're kind of, they go together as modern films about the Holocaust and, yeah, modern films about people being hidden during the Holocaust. 
imaginary friends. Yeah, yeah, imaginary friends. Yeah, actually, yeah, there's more similarities than actually I had uh, anticipated, actually. Now that you, then you mentioned that, yeah, um, they will make a good double bill. If any cinema wants to program that, there's a good recommendation. But yeah, obviously, but this is much more a uh, tragic ending than Jojo Rabbit, which I guess, that's a mild spoiler for Jojo Rabbit if you've not seen it, but I assume everyone has at this point. Yeah, I don't know whether it means you should put Jojo Rabbit first or second in the double bill. Depends whether you want to end on the sad note exactly, or the, ha- exactly. the happy note. Yeah, I mean, I guess stories about the Holocaust are very sad because, I don't know, yeah, there's no way to think about the Holocaust that isn't in an incredibly tragic way for, for obvious reasons. I guess Jojo Rabbit does, like, I guess, emphasise on the people who did survive and things like that. Even though Jojo Rabbit has some quite sad bits in it, to be fair. Yeah, I don't remember Jojo Rabbit being one long party, I will admit. It's a comedy or a comedy drama, but um, there are definitely some very, very sort of sad moments. It's not a, uh, a frivolous comedy i suppose i mean he's quite divisive i mean i listened to one film review podcast that absolutely said like you cannot make jokes about the holocaust and jojo rabbit shouldn't be made on that grounds now i don't take that view i think jojo rabbit has something to to say and also yeah films like that do make history more accessible everyone should read like the diary of Anne frank and other books about the holocaust that are you know primary sources but we live in a society where People don't have the time or the inclination to do that. So if a film like Jojo Rabbit can bring some of the, the details home to people to remind people, because again, that's the point that where is Anne Frank trying to make that we sort of remembered Anne Frank, but have forgotten the lesson of her life. You know, when we're sort of queuing to go to the Anne Frank Museum, but at the same time, refugees are living in tents and being rounded up by the police. You know, one of the points he's trying to make is, have we forgotten the lessons, even though we remember the people? Okay, that does sound like more of a serious one than Jojo Rabbit, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, also if you're a fan of Ari Folman, I think this is very good. His second film was at the uh, the Congress was one of those interesting failures, I guess. It was a bit, it's very strange. It's a mix of live action and, and animation. But yeah, this is this one I think is more of a successful project. <laughs> Okay, and first up today, one of the TV events of the year, probably. It is Netflix's adaptation of The Sandman, the popular comic written by Neil Gaiman and drawn by a range of artists. I think the artists on the first few arcs, which are the ones being adapted here, were primarily Mike Dringenberg and Sam Keefe. And yes, this is, of course, the story of Morpheus, a.k.a. Dream, the Lord of Dreams, who is kidnapped one day by a bad English wizard played by Charles Dance and ends up locked in a big globe while dreams go to shit. And after a hundred years or so in this big glass globe, he is freed and must now try and recover his kingdom from the shit it has gone to. Alistair, we've both seen this series. What did you think of it? So yeah, I like this. I really like the deep cosmic story, how it takes on these mythological and metaphysical concepts and finds a way to bring them to life. It does so in a way that feels quite modern. You know, it has exciting fantasy story along the way. It's it's slightly more at a distance, I would say, than a lot of contemporary comic adaptations. I mean, we were just talking about Marvel. We are a very long way from the Marvel tone. It's very serious. It's quite, yeah, metaphysical. It's very goth. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've got the exact coat that Sandman wears in most of the show. And yeah, his all-black wardrobe is pretty similar to mine. But I do find a way that there is a real kind of rich story here. It doesn't go out of its way to throw, I don't know, something like sarcastic quibs or jokes or things like that to kind of keep you strung along. Some bits are quite slow. It does have builds. But I kind of like like the fact that it, to a degree... It keeps you at a distance. And I did like the kind of the way it treats these big metaphysical concepts with the kind of weight that they need. So, yeah, I think... It's maybe not for everyone, but I did enjoy it. Yeah, no, I enjoyed this as well. I was always intrigued to see how they do this because Sandman is another comic series that people have been trying to adapt for years and many have taken to saying it's basically unfilmable. It turns out pretty filmable. It's more or less works, I think. They've done a good job of actually making it into a sort of watchable fantasy show. Like the way the world slowly unfolds in front of you, the way they sort of guide you into it is pretty smooth and pretty well done, I think. The accessibility is obviously quite primary here. Like they're explaining things a lot. They've given Morpheus the Raven to talk to, who I don't think was quite as present in the comics. And yeah, they've done a good job of preserving sort of the magic of it, but making sure it's always fairly clear what's going on. Like I watched this with my partner, who is not someone who's read much Sandman beyond, I think, like maybe one collected edition ages ago. And yeah, she followed it fine. 
I followed it fine. It definitely draws you in in quite a, a fun way. Like, it's one of these shows, I was praising the boys for this a while ago, and I think I praised other things as well, for having, like, a fully populated world and actually feeling quite dense and, like, there's quite a lot going on. Like, it actually bops from place to place and there's always different things happening. And yeah, I think that's quite a nice effect. It does have a good sort of sense of the epic, which does make it, you know, quite appealing to sort of lose yourself in a show like this as different storylines sort of run along together and drift in and out of each other. The way there are characters who are quite scene-stealing and could arguably have their own shows, maybe they will, who knows, who only do like one episode in this, is quite impressive. So yeah, there's a lot going on here. I don't think it's all masterpiece. There are some episodes I think are better than others, but I think as a whole, it's pretty successful. It's very watchable. Yeah, I completely agree with you that you, you get this feel there's a whole world out there and it kind of introduces the whole thing. Yeah, similar to like the boys or things like that. It does feel comprehensive. And some of my favourite bits of the show were like later on in the series. Yeah, as the series went along, I kind of preferred it more because then they built out the world a bit more and they introduced new characters and more plot lines. And yeah, which you will get the same sense of the richness you know when they've layered several storylines over the um the initial one of sam man just reclaiming his his items of office yeah i think the first two episodes although pretty good at the end of those i was still thinking okay i, I think i like this i'm not yet 100 percent sure i really like it i'm enjoying it but i'm not you know blown away and then i think it did build quite well after those first couple of episodes with quite a good strong run yeah absolutely i I heard from, anecdotally from someone that basically the third episode is where it gets really good. So I was kind of prepared for sort of a slow intro. And like I say, this, you know, this show, it is quite slow paced, but, you know, not in a bad way. It's got a, a different tempo. To ma- again, maybe the one we're used to from both comic adaptations and a lot of the TV that we watch in the modern format. And it does kind of do about two episodes introducing everything and the plot. I mean, the first episode cannons through about 100 years of backstory in sort of like 45 minutes. But yeah, by the time you get to the third episode, episode and a lot of these sort of bits are laid down yeah i thought that was very good um they you know introduce some more characters that's when they introduce jenna louise coleman who we all know and love from doctor who as joanna constantine and yeah i thought she was excellent yeah in the role she had a sort of brief appearance later on in the show but basically in that one episode and yeah that was a good scene stealing performance yeah, Jenna Coleman was the one bit I, I was occasionally in two minds about because I thought she was playing it a lot bigger and broader than everyone else. Yeah, I don't know. Like you said, Sandman is quite a quiet show in a lot of ways. Everyone else is playing it fairly hushed. I, I thought Jenna Coleman was kind of playing it a bit like she was still in Doctor Who and occasionally it seemed a bit odd, but mm. I was mostly entertained. I mean, you can get away with one character who's the big personality or something like that, but yeah, there I can see what you mean by there is a sort of a tonal mismatch there. I mean, the main character of Dream, he is very much this sort of, I'm a cosmic, you know, endless being. I'm the personification lord of dreams. I'm so distant and removed from even other spiritual creatures, demons, ghosts, other dreams, what have you. And also even further removed from regular human beings. You do get this kind of real sense of distance which kind of works, but it, obviously he's the main character and he is a little bit impenetrable. You know, he is a bit like the Doctor, but without the charming quirkiness that the Doctor has in different actors bring to the character to greater or lesser degrees. And probably most people remember the people who are slightly more over the top with the quirkiness, like David Tennant or you know, Tom Baker. But that's why it helps to have these other characters to focus on who maybe are a bit more relatable and a bit more, I don't know, out there with their emotions. Yeah, I think... What Jenna Coleman's doing just about works for the bit she's in it and you know maybe she'll get a spin-off to go full ham and Morpheus the lead character I mean he is quite quiet and quite taciturn as you say and that's like many things in this show pretty much adapted whole cloth of the comics yeah he's very very much like that there as well so it was always a bit of a challenging role how much can you you know stamp yourself on the show and come across as the charismatic lead despite being mostly either quite quiet or talking in quite sort of clipped emotionless tones and I think he just about nails it I think he does a good job I did change my mind a few times whether I liked uh, Tom Sturridge as Morpheus but by the end of the show I think he he successfully sold it to me so fair enough he was good I'm sure it's, it's a difficult part to play and he conveys a lot of emotion with not much sort of speech and as sort of facial expressions i got the the impression sort of going back to the thing you were just saying that this strike me as quite faithful to the comic i've not read the comic and it's yeah it was certainly accessible to someone who hasn't read the comic you don't feel like you have to but there were some episodes like there's one episode that entirely took place in a diner that i felt sounds like that would have been single issue of the comic and there were some sort of magical battles which they could have i guess done with kind of heaps of cgi 
and sort of effects and things like that. But they kind of did it with a series of interposed separate imagery when Dream's battling Satan and they're turning into different creatures to sort of fight each other. But rather than this being a special effects transforming fest, it's a kind of a series of interposed images of the things that they're turning into. It's kind of a hard scene to describe if you haven't seen it. And I I guess that's the thing that would work quite well in a comic. And it's it's an interesting visual choice to make here. And I'm glad they did something different with it. But is that just a, yeah, the comic coming into the TV show? I can't remember exactly how that specific scene is staged in the comics. But yeah, the general tone here is very faithful. Yeah, it's not quite one-to-one. I think they get through about 14, 15 issues of the comic in these 11 episodes. So there's a a tiny bit of compression, yeah. But fundamentally, a lot of it is fairly faithful. Like, the first issue, I think, takes place in and around Morpheus being imprisoned by Roderick Burgess and then escaping. And much like the first episode, and, you know, there's an episode where he meets Constantine, there's an issue where he meets Constantine. Obviously, it's John Constantine in the comics. And there's an issue when he goes to hell, an issue where he goes to a diner, the issue where he beats death. Although... In the comics, the issue where he beats death and the issue about his friendship with that guy Hob Gadling, mm. those were two separate issues. They've sort of squashed them together. Yeah, I mean, that was very much a game of two halves. Yeah, so those two halves were separate issues of the comic. Which, yeah, that makes sense. So it's not quite one-to-one. There is, as I say, some combining and some compressing. But in all honesty, there's nothing here that makes me think, at least in terms of story changes, yeah, mate, that was shit. I think they've done a, a decent job of, I think, converting everything. I think sometimes it's a bit visually less exciting than the comic was. Like, the comic, I think Neil Gaiman is the name most associated with Sandman, partly because they have different artists for every storyline, so there's not really the will to list every artist who works on it whenever you credit it. People are a lot more likely to say, Neil Gaiman's Sandman, than they are to say, Neil Gaiman, Sam Keith, Mike Dringenberg, Jill Thompson, Kelly Jones, and many, many other artists, Sandman. It's just the way things go. But the artists were a pretty huge part of it. One of the reasons... Sandman became this massive, defining cultural thing and inspired a generation of young goths. It's because it looked so damn cool. And, you know, there's a reason it looked so damn cool. And it was not just Neil Gaiman. And I think the series, although it looks very impressive for a Netflix show, and I think they have done a good job of realising everything in a way that looks good and doesn't take you out of the show, I don't think it's visually massively cool most of the time, apart from a few fun moments. They've clearly got a bigger budget than the average Netflix show to realise things. I don't know if that's the fact they're partnered with Warner Brothers. I noticed every episode has the Warner Brothers logo on the front as well as the Netflix one, and Netflix don't strike me as the sort of type to share their logo space. In fact, they put their logo on things that uh, they didn't make, like <laughs> like Better Call Saul. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know the, the corporate ins and outs of it, but yeah, I thought it was... It looked like most fantasy TV looked in terms of level of style and production values. And, you know, again, there's clearly a certain amount of desire to get people through the door here, you know. Mm. This show must cost an absolute fortune to make it at, you know, this level. And... They've got to just be desperate to make it as accessible as possible. You know, yes, they could film it like a cool art film, but it will probably take a massive chunk off their potential audience. Yeah. So, you know, much as we all enjoy cool art films, especially Alistair. (laughs) But yeah, they could do that, but they've clearly chosen not to. I guess the name Sandman associated with Neo Game as well has a lot of cultural cachet and they want to make it, I guess, probably accessible to people like me, I suppose, who haven't read the comic but are interested in it. So we'll start with the TV show. So they want to make it, yeah, is accessible to people, yeah, coming at it from that angle and probably who are also fans of fantasy TV fantasy and other media i mean i felt it looked it looked pretty good i felt there were some bits like the sort of the dreamland and the kind of shifting tapestries looked pretty impressive the the hell looked pretty impressive there's definitely some shows like i don't know in the good place when they go to hell and hell is basically two rooms because that's as far as the budget stretched and hell at least had like you know arenas and towers and wastelands and things like that so they've still got some money but yeah they didn't this is not sort of like pushing the envelope in terms of visuals or visual flair or design it's nowhere near as visually interesting as say legion was they've got some money to do a decent job i will be interested to see if this is massively successful and it certainly seems to have been at least quite successful whether they get piles more money and whether the next few seasons can look even cooler. Like, as I said the other week, I was watching Stranger Things 4 lately and that show is phenomenally expensive looking. It's they've clearly got so much money. So, yeah, I'll be interested to see if we see a Sandman budget trending ever higher. You know, or if the special effects are so complicated that this really is all they can afford. Well, yeah, it's certainly been successful. Like, yeah, it's been critically well received. I've seen a few fans doing the whole movie it's not good as the comic but generally the consensus seems to be it's well received obviously there's the predictable people who are like why is Constantine now a woman why is death like black 
and things like that. You yeah, just be... don't need to give them too much airtime, do you? No, exactly. The long and the short of it is that I think it's, it appears to be very well received and be very popular. So, yeah, this is certainly one of the fantasy cultural events of the year, certainly fantasy TV. Well, yeah, I, mean, I think I, I think a lot of people genuinely weren't sure if this was going to be decent. Like, I think some people saw the trailers and thought, okay, the special effects look a bit grey and flat. Maybe this is going to be shit. And, you know, I've heard varying opinions on whether it's amazing, but there definitely seems to be consensus that it isn't shit. Yeah. So, considering how, again, unfilmable a lot of people think it is, that's pretty impressive. I mean, I think some episodes have been having just been slightly pissy about the visuals. I will say that Diner episode was fucking great. Like, including visually. Maybe because they were shooting in a, like, constrained physical environment. I thought they made that one look really good. Yeah, no, that was a good, you know, one location, real-time episode unfolding. Again, some some of those episodes can, you know, every show tries it eventually. Varying degrees of success. Yeah, that was successful, yeah. They did a lot of outdoor shooting, lots of stuff shot in Hammersmith, which kind of been cheap. Yeah, I mean, you compared it to Doctor Who earlier, and, you know, the thing I liked about it, which is kind of Doctor Who-y, is the, the range of different kinds of episodes and different, you know, levels of involvement from Morpheus. Mm they were willing to try like it did feel like quite an interesting varied show it wasn't just one log blob of the same thing which if you follow my tv reviews you'll know makes me happy but yeah i liked the variance of it i liked the we can send him anywhere angle yeah and it's much more episodic actually than a lot of stuff we watch recently most episodes have a relatively self-contained plot apart from really only at the end did it become more of a yeah you kind of the arc plot took over but even though like even like the last episode entirely takes place in a serial killer convention or largely takes place in one which is again sort of self-contained one episode plot yeah well they did then add the bonus episode of course yes yes which had two short stories one animated yep two more issues of the comic you'll be shocked to hear yeah yeah, no, they were both quite fun. The Calliope one was a lot rapier in the comic, and probably to everyone's relief, they've dialed that down substantially for the TV show. Yeah, but yeah, it was still there and it was still unpleasant, and yeah, that's what they're aiming at, a quite dark and unpleasant story. Arthur Darville, very good, again, yeah, Doctor Who people. Yeah, playing on his natural sort of matey charm and then pushing that for a twist when he turns out to be a prick. Yeah, there were quite a few Doctor Who voice actors in the animated one, and obviously a yeah, Derek Jacobi as well in the Calliope episode. So yeah, I think yeah, quite a lot of Doctor Who crossover. <laughs> I think it's just you know in a similar world, and plus, as I say, I think they're similar kinds of shows. I mean, also there's um, they've got sort of a lot of the big names of British TV, I guess, partly because they've got money and they want it to be popular. So yeah, Stephen Fry is in a couple of episodes. Charles Dance is in the first episode. They've got money to get in names. Yeah, like I say, Derek Jacoby does does a scene. Well, yeah, especially because the sort of anthology format of the show, you know, they can get big names in because it's only one or two episodes. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot easier than trying to get them for the whole season, I'm guessing. Like, the only characters who are in most or every episode are, what, the Sandman himself, a couple of his dreaming sidekicks, and a couple of the villains. Are the only ones who get, like, multiple episodes. Yeah. Everyone else is, like, one or two. Yeah, so if they make more of this, they can do more interesting actor cameos. But yeah, yeah, so this is, I think, a promising start, an interesting addition to the, the telly landscape. I am quite up for it. Yeah, I hope they make more of it and continue in this cosmic vein and, yeah, expanding out because, yeah, now that they've established a lot of it, and obviously, yeah, there's hinted at where the plot's going to go in the next season. So, yeah, it'd be good if we, now that a lot of the, the foundations have been laid, they can do more, get to dive in really for the next series. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm up for it. I mean, I'm sure it'll take an eternity, so, you know, see you in 2024, but I'm looking forward to it when it happens. Okay, and last up today, another of the TV events of the year. It's the final six-episode run of Better Call Saul. This is, of course, the Breaking Bad prologue, which has been building, building and building, slowly and steadily to a climax over the last few years, and we finally got there. Saul Goodman, played by Bob Odenkirk, and his partner in crime, Kim, have finally pulled their big heist on their former boss slash nemesis, Howard Hamlin. And, unfortunately, due to Saul's crime connections and various other bits of bad luck, it's all going to go to shit, and we're going to be catapulted into a bleak, black and white, post-breaking bad future. We have seen all six of these episodes, and we may need to administer some spoilers shortly, but we'll try and give a bit of broad opinion before that, in case anyone, you know, cares deeply about our opinion on this, but hasn't seen the episode. So it's whoever you are. Hi, I guess. Alistair, spoiler for opinions. I would say that this is a fitting ending to both the series of Better Call Saul that we had, but yeah, also to the greater Breaking Bad extended universe. And certainly by the end, we are sort of wrapping up all the loose ends from both Better Call Saul and 
Breaking Bad as a show. So, yeah, this kind of wraps it all up in a neat way. Yeah, finishes with the focus on the Saul character and offers real pathos at the end. So, yeah, and, you know, there were moments when, yeah, there was like a tear in my eye. You know, Bob Odekirk, great performance. The writing, as you know, as we said, I think every time we review this show, it moves slowly. It lets it take its time over a process. But when, you know, it brings it all together and brings the things it's been slowly boiling to a climax, to mix my metaphors, um, then it really is, you know, emotionally and dramatically spectacular. So, yeah, full marks. Saul can leave the stage in glory now. Yeah, no, I really liked it. I thought it was a really great, considered, thoughtful ending. I think it very much stayed in the style it's been in. And, you know, it's interesting to sort of contrast to the ending of Breaking Bad, which I will now spoil, which did very much go out in a blaze of glory and allow Walt to maybe redeem himself a little bit, or at least come across as not the worst guy here due to a bunch of drug-dealing Nazis to fight. And... Better Call Saul, although it doesn't flog the character either, I think does have a bit more of a nuanced eye on his flaws and, you know, his flaws and his strengths, you know, it's, the show is ultimately kind of a tragedy, but it's nice how it's a thoughtful, redemptive character study in the end. There's a note of hope here, even if it's very careful to ultimately give Saul a lot of what he deserves. And yeah, there's some fun Easter eggs and cameos. This show is, I think, very good about throwing those in for the long-term fans, but not letting it become distracting or a chore or something that takes away from the wider point they're trying to make the people appear the obvious ones you'd expect to see again in the spirit of spoiler free i won't name them but surely you know who i mean and yeah it was interesting how they paced it i must admit i've been so trained for a slow pace on this show i expected the prequel stage to go on longer than it did but no they jumped and they did some of the time hopping stuff we've been kind of expecting them to do from the beginning the last four episodes of this were very ambitious very good enjoyed them a lot yeah i would say that's probably my favorite part of the whole thing the final four episodes that take place post breaking bad we're kind of bringing the story up to present day again really paying off you know everything from the soul show and also from breaking bad itself yeah i mean there was just a sort of some great small self-contained story about him trying to do crimes and confidence schemes in Omaha, Nebraska, which is where he's hiding out after the events of Breaking Bad, very much the opposite of Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's cold, it's wintry, it's grey, both in hue and in uh, emotional power. And yeah, there's a small bit of him doing his usual crime stuff, in which case we get classic saw building up a con, a focus on process, the amazing moment when it all comes together. And then, yeah, that goes to shit and then triggers the final events, which is, yeah, what happens when consequences finally catch up to Saul, which I suppose we'd have to drop a spoiler wall to talk about in detail. Yeah, I don't think this counts as a spoiler. I admired their commitment to the black and white during that sequence. Like, I admired their willingness to stick with it to the bitter end. I sort of expected them to reach a point where he, like, I don't know, becomes Saul again and starts doing pranks. And when he reasserts that part of his personality, we're suddenly back in colour. Yeah, or we'll find some other excuse to go back into colour. But they didn't. They just stuck with it. Good for them. Yeah, stuck right to the end that everything post-Breaking Bad is in black and white. And even, like, there's a few additional scenes thrown in, which I guess are sort of flashbacks, but or sort of parallel scenes, which are, take place, I guess, after all the prequel events are over. But but yeah, but run parallel to Breaking Bad and kind of build that out. And that's how they, you know, bring in cameos from like Walter White and Jesse Pinkman. Yeah, those bits obviously are in colour as well. So there are some splashes of colour in the final few episodes. And they kind of, again, broaden out the world of Better Call Saul. It adds some more character dimension to the interactions between Saul and Walter White or Jesse. There is one moment, which I don't think this is too much of a spoiler. Or should we just say spoilers from this on? Don't stop the ball. I feel that we've made our points. If you care about spoilers then off you go it's been out for a few weeks by the time this comes out you've had your chance and there's nothing more in this episode but yeah um, this isn't a big one but yeah a bit when Kim runs into Jesse loitering outside Saul's office before they got involved in a big way in one of these intermediate scenes and yeah Kim well says to Jesse that Saul's alright he's a good lawyer um, or it implies it's, it's more complicated than that, but anyway, let's not get bogged down the details. But that obviously moment is like, well, that led to Saul working with Jesse and Walter White, which led to the destruction of his business and him having to flee and live quietly and assume a false identity and destroys everything that he'd worked hard to create. And ultimately, I guess, on some level, although she didn't know at the time, Kim is responsible for saying something nice about Saul to a total stranger. And yeah, I guess the show is big on those little moments of small actions have big impacts. You know, a butterfly flaps its wings and there's a cyclone of meth related <laughs> violence that follows yeah no as ever there's a very strong detail orientated game in 
the better course all Breaking Bad verse and it's very much a play here and yeah I liked the way they, they danced through Breaking Bad I think some people possibly expected them to do a bit more detail on you know the Breaking Bad crossover of Better Call Saul like maybe actually have a substantial run of episodes dancing between the Breaking Bad raindrops but I always felt like that seemed like a bit of a strain we were more likely to skip it entirely or maybe get a few scenes and sure enough we got a few scenes yeah I thought it was about the right amount anything more would have just been a bit like yeah yeah you know this show isn't is related to that other really really famous show and with some of these iconic characters but although I will admit I do think they left it quite oblique what actually happens in Breaking Bad like I don't know how many people watch Better Call Saul and haven't seen Breaking Bad but I do wonder if those people were a bit what by the time they got to the end or a bit sort of okay time to check Wikipedia yeah possibly I mean those bits maybe don't stand on their own if you haven't seen Breaking Bad but yeah I guess you can probably you know if you're an intelligent enough viewer you can pick up basically that like he gets involved with these people one of them turns out to be you know especially nasty and destructive well yeah yeah and then yeah there is an emphasis in those final episodes you know what Saul's on the wrong from is the connection to the massive amount of murder committed by Walter White specifically and also yeah laundering his money keeping him out of jail and all of that and that is one of the reasons why he's going to be arrested and sent to prison for a huge length of the time and why he has to hide an assumed identity and all that because yeah he's been connected to a lot of carnage and facilitate a lot of carnage but then in the final episode the moment when he realizes what he's done he gets his comeuppance and he atones publicly for what he's done he also atones for the nasty things he did in better call Saul over the years including you know how he inadvertently led to his brother's suicide you know, how he mistreated people, you know, including Kim, or at least led Kim down a dark path. So yeah, he atones for it all at the end, which I felt was a, a fitting ending. I don't know. I think the idea is he's got a lot to atone for, and therefore he probably fully deserves to be in that prison cell. Yeah. It was always going to be jail or death for Saul Goodman, and I feel like they already did death in Breaking Bad, so... Yeah, and he, I don't know, he seems like a man who could redeem himself. I guess he's kind of, he's in purgatory now, purifying his soul, if we're going to adopt a sort of Christian religious, methodological approach to this theological approach or whatever you want to call it kind of he's been sent to purgatory to purify his soul rather than being forever damned like Walter White is and then punished with by dying yeah he gets to go to prison and move slowly towards redemption which Walter White didn't get to because in fairness he probably deserves it more I mean there's a point at the end of the penultimate episode where uh, Saul is alone in the house with that woman who's recognised him and he does the sort of he you know pulls that phone cord tight like he's about to strangle her yeah. and ultimately he just can't do it he just drops the phone cord and runs but I did come away from that thinking okay I feel like Walt might have strangled her yeah yeah I mean that's the thing yeah he's, he chooses not to, to do the, the terrible things and yeah there's also there's a flashback uh, with his brother they managed to yeah, get the actor playing Chuck back who was very good and it's nice to have him for that cameo appearance and also ref- yeah it kind of hints at the complex relationship Saul had with his brother and that there was some love there as well as a lot of malice but yeah and ultimately it all going back to that Saul is a complicated man he's motivated by many things he's always aware himself of what's driving him to make his actions and yeah sometimes it's to feed the greedy exploitative Saul side but sometimes he's still Jimmy you know someone who yeah is basically decent just wants to get on in the world, looks after the people he cares for. And at the end, yeah, there's a symbolic moment of him saying, I'm Jimmy now, not Saul again. And yeah, he's uh, that's part of his atonement, which again is a nice little character moment. But still, even right at the end when he's in prison, everyone's still calling him Saul and referred to as Saul, I guess. That indicates that you can't escape these things. You know, your, your actions and consequences of your actions follow you in life, even if you have atoned for them. Well, and also, you know, Saul might be beginning to emerge on his redemption, but he's not stupid enough to turn down the chance to cash in his face to have a nicer time in prison. Yeah. He hasn't gone, you know, full monkishly living in a single box. Yeah. Which, again, I think is realistic. And I think, yeah, as a character study especially, and an exercise in sort of acting, this is great stuff. This is possibly better, better than Breaking Bad in that regard. I think as a sort of carefully modulated character study. Mm, like amazing performances, slow burn writing. Yeah, the stakes are lower in the sense that there's not as much like mayhem and destruction and murder as there is in Breaking Bad. Which is why when you hear Saul's rap sheet... Yeah, the worst stuff was all from Breaking Bad, but it's more about how we interact, but also, yeah, how we lose our morality and do nasty things. Like, yeah, Saul points out, or his lawyer points out to him in the end, what he did to his brother wasn't a crime, not in the way that, like, covering up Walter White's murders was, but the loss of his humanity was what he did to his brother, which meant he also had to atone for that. 
Well, yeah, I mean, that's possibly the main difference in watching this show and watching Breaking Bad. In Breaking Bad, a lot of the time, you see him doing something awful, and you're immediately sitting there thinking, well, fucking hell, mate, you're doing something awful. It sure is another step on your road to hell. And Mm. in Saul, you have this almost more realistic experience of him doing something, which kind of, because we're with him and he's convinced himself it's an okay thing to do, it doesn't necessarily seem awful at the time. And then you later, as sometimes happens in real life, when the full ramifications of it become clear, you're like, oh, no, shit, that was appalling, wasn't it? Retrospectively, that sure was a love of you steps on his road to hell yeah and yeah it's a more nuanced character study even though Breaky Bad yes has more crowd pleasing action and comedy and I think might well be more entertaining in some ways but this is a very very well made bit of television yeah and it's a, it's a quieter drama but it's got real depth to it and it's got really well developed characters and yeah amazing bits of writing and yeah when the plot takes a while to turn but when it turns it is yeah emotionally and dramatically spectacular but yeah right until the end even with like the, uh, the last few loose ends when it's tying up with Saul's relationship with Kim which is yeah how's that going to end is kind of the, the question that's left right to the end and even then yeah there's in those the sort of last scene is a quiet one of just her visiting her in prison it is still very emotionally powerful because it's that sort of show yeah and you know since i was talking about visuals with sandman you know sandman might not be the sort of show that really prioritizes having amazing cinematic visuals but this show this this show looks amazing yeah and even though it's again it's shots of like you know suburban nebraska and things like that you know rows of condominiums and you know normal bars and just uh, the sort of shopping centers that are found in every city in in the world but yeah there's something about the way they film it to make it seem like this is the site of yeah of a of a metaphysical struggle a sort of faustian play about you know asking questions like are we damned by predetermined or do our actions give us some freedom you know these big things are there and are kind of the visuals kind of live up to that in a way but yeah with their focus on, on something very mundane yeah great stuff it makes me want to go back and rewatch baking bad so that i can then watch this again yeah, yeah, yeah i'd certainly unreservedly recommend this definitely one of the the best things yeah seen this year or probably in many years especially the uh, the final few episodes i mean you kind of have to watch the you know five and a half seasons before it to, for, to get the emotional payoff. But yeah, when it all comes together at the end, especially those yeah those few last episodes, the emotional stakes are high. It's all closing in around Saul and the consequence of his actions. It is pure cathartic drama. Yeah, yeah. I think the last couple of seasons of Vertical Saul especially have been absolutely amazing. That's all we have time for. If you have enjoyed this episode of Moderate Fantasy Violence, then please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and please do leave us a nice review while you're there so that other people can find out about the show. You can also visit our website, moderatefantasyviolence.com, where you can find other episodes of the podcast, bonus audio clips, and short written pieces by Nick and myself. And if that wasn't enough, you can also follow us on social media, where we are MFE Podcast on Twitter and Moderate Fantasy Violence on Facebook. And for still more, you can also follow me personally on Twitter. I've been Nick Bryan, I am at NickMB there, and Nick Bryan writes on Facebook and nickbryan.com on the broader wild west of the internet you can find me on twitter where i am alistair jr ball and you can find more of my writing at redtrainblog.com join us for the next issue of the podcast in two weeks time where we will be doing a daring underwater rescue in 13 lives and then fighting over the iron throne in house of the dragon join us for those then goodbye bye